Hello and welcome to 2023. My name is Tony. It's customary to ask, did you have a good Christmas and how was your new year? But for a number of reasons, I'm not going to do that. One, I don't care. Two, it's not really any of my business. And three, I have an aversion to pleasantries that are likely to summon forth outright falsehoods, putting a positive spin on things, or worse, outpourings of self-pity in woe, unless I'm the person expressing that stuff. The world seems much the same as it was before the festivities, so let's Let's just leave it there, shall we? Mike Hodges wrote the script for and directed my favourite British film, The Magnificent and Incomparable Get Carter. For this alone, I revere him as though he were a god. That he peaked early in his movie-making career is neither here nor there. That he never creatively matched his first feature film ever again, not important. He wrote and directed Get Carter, and that's more than enough to elicit my undying adulation. Now that's not to say that I haven't enjoyed some of his subsequent films and rate them very highly indeed, because I have and I do. So I'm going to reminisce over his third feature film, The Terminal Man. The one prior to it, Pulp in 1972, saw him teamed again with Michael Caine, and I aim to get to that particular gem at some later stage. But for now, because it's a real neglected underdog of a movie that never stood a chance due to the inexplicable behaviour of the studio Warner Brothers, I've decided it to fight its corner. Least I can do, better late than never. The film is based on Michael Crichton's 1972 novel of the same name. Crichton is the canny hack who gave us Westworld, the original, and Jurassic Park. He wrote the screenplay for The Terminal Man, but the suits at Warner Brothers had some issues with it, so Hodges ended up both scripting and directing. After a botched preview screening and some bad reviews, Warners didn't promote the film, gave it a limited release in the States, and decided not to release it at all in Britain. So I never got to see it on the big screen, just a late night TV showing in the mid-70s. Stanley Kubrick and Terence Malick were big fans. Malick especially waxed lyrical about it and praised Hodges' use of imagery. Hodges is on record as stating he was inspired by the paintings of Edward Hopper, which he described as depicting the loneliness of urban America. He originally wanted to film it in black and white, but Warner's threw a fit, so that didn't happen. Oh, and finally, it was well received in Japan, where it was a big hit. George Siegel took the lead. Now, Siegel had an enviable back catalogue of dramatic screen roles behind him at this point. King Rat, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, The Quiller Memorandum, and The St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But he was seen more as a light comedy actor. Hodges specifically wanted him for the part, to cast someone deliberately against type. He felt that Siegel was terrific, but conceded that audiences may have been alienated by seeing him cast as such a spectacularly unsympathetic and monstrous character. There is no remastered Blu-ray version copies of the grainy DVD cut are all that are floating around out there as far as I can tell. My apologies then for the less than stellar images used in this video. Hodges screened a director's cut at the Edinburgh Film Festival in 2003, and as much as I'd like to get my grubby mitts on a copy, I don't think it was ever commercially released. So that's pissed in my chips. Again. The Terminal Man is a science fiction movie, and one in keeping with Crichton's recurring theme of amazing scientific advances going horribly wrong or being abused and misused, as seen in Westworld, Coma, and Jurassic Park. Harry Benson, George Siegel, is a computer scientist who, after a car accident, begins to suffer with seizures and blackouts, during which he is prone to uncontrollable rages and acts of violence. He has beaten up his wife and attempted to shoot his neighbours. Wife has divorced him, and he's not exactly won any resident you'd most like to live next door to awards. Neurosurgeon Ellis, Richard Dysart, and his colleagues McPherson, Donald Moffat, and Morris Michael C. Gwynn, with reluctant support from a sceptical Dr. Ross, Joan Hackett, propose a radical new procedure to Benson, who is languishing in prison. They will implant a miniature computer in his neck, which will send impulses to tiny electrodes in his brain, shutting down any seizures as soon as they begin. Despite having developed the paranoid belief that machines are going to take over the world, Benson, a highly intelligent individual with an IQ of 144, consents to the procedure. As is the way of such things, especially 70s sci-fi flicks, the early impression is that things are going to go tits up sooner rather than later. Following the operation, Benson makes a good recovery, and when the computer in his neck overrides an induced seizure, it's cause for celebration. Champagne and cigars all round. Dr. Ross isn't so sure. She asks the tech team to closely monitor Benson, and they soon find that his brain is becoming addicted to the electrical impulses, inducing seizures at increasingly shorter intervals to get more stimulating blasts from the electrodes. 
Harry has planned to escape from the hospital, where he is under police guard. Assisted by his girlfriend, Angela, Jill Clayburgh, he makes a break for it, and they hole up in her apartment. A combination of seizures and shocks drive Harry into a violent frenzy, wherein he smashes Angela in the face with a snow globe and robotically stabs her with some scissors on a waterbed. He evades the police and kills a Catholic priest in a church, then invades Dr. Ross's home to murder her. Ross narrowly escapes after stabbing Harry with a kitchen knife. Armed with an automatic pistol, Harry stumbles into a vast cemetery, actually Forest Lawn in LA, where he finds an open grave. Jumping in, he suffers a prolonged seizure. The police arrive with sharpshooters in a helicopter. Dr. Ross begs Harry to give himself up, but he purposefully raises his gun and the police snipers take him out. Mike Hodges has given us a deliberately cold and bleak film, where even the final set piece in a cemetery bathed in dazzling sunshine feels distinctly chilly and devoid of warmth. I can certainly see why Hodges first visualised it being shot in black and white. There are a series of elements that make the Terminal Man worth a watch, and they just happen to be the self-same things likely to turn people off in equal numbers. Either you'll take to it, or you won't. There's no middle ground. The imagery is potent and affecting. Shots of long, sterile hospital corridors and Spartan reception areas, isolated characters in vacuous spaces, a meticulous focus on the hardware evident and technical process used in Harry's operation. The technology depicted seems quaint by today's standards, archaic even, but at the time seemed very high tech. These things some are going to find tedious, whilst others will find them enthralling. The more intimate scenes have a pure quality of desolate brutality and sanitised beauty, Angela's murder being a case in point. As Harry stabs her on the waterbed and the water mingles with spraying blood and rose petals, Hodges cuts to the floor, which is formed by white tiles. The tiles resemble computer circuitry. The grooves between the tiles fill with red fluid as the blood and water continues to flow and Harry continues to stab like a crazed automaton. The death of romance at the unfeeling hands of technology. It's a masterpiece of framing and editing and is the film's money shot. Second to this, though, would be Harry turning up at Ross's house. It's an unsettling moment that ends with her stabbing him, locking herself in the bathroom, whilst he smashes a jagged hole in the door and looks through, while scrabbling to reach the handle. Some years later, Stanley Kubrick, a fan of the Terminal Man, would enact a disturbingly similar scene in his complex horror masterpiece, The Shining. It's the infamous Jack Nicholson, here's Johnny moment, and when you think about it, it's quite uncanny just how alike the two scenes are. I'm not suggesting for a moment that Kubrick stole from Hodge's film, just seems to have drawn some inspiration from it. Performances are top notch, especially Siegel, who projects as clever, calculating and creepy. Harry is a character who by right should be considered a victim of events beyond his control, but Siegel portrays him as an unlikable academic with sociopathic tendencies. He is more in common with the machines he believes are taking over the world when it comes to emotional depth and fibre. Even before he starts going off the rails, there is something unnerving about Harry, like his soul, if one believes in such a thing, has gone absent without leave and isn't planning on a return journey anytime soon. Wearing a blonde fright wig to conceal his shaved head, jerking and spasming violently, even when he breaks into his former place of work, smashes the computers and robots with a crowbar and falls to his knees repeating in agony, let it stop, over and over, he doesn't elicit much sympathy. Apparently, the opening sequence with black and white photos showing Harry and his wife and kids before the accident were added at Warner Brothers' insistence, an attempt to humanise the character. Hodges later removed it from his director's cut. Harry is not supposed to generate empathy in the audience, just insidious distrust and fear. If it's humanity you're after, it's in short supply. Joan Hackett's concerned and doubtful doctor and Jill Clayburgh's doomed but loyal girlfriend is about as close as you'll get. Hodges chose to have no original score composed for the film. Instead, there are repeat snatches of Goldberg Variation No. 25 by Johann Sebastian Bach, played on a piano by Glenn Gould. The theme from the 1954 John Wayne movie The High and the Mighty, composed by Dmitry Tiomkin, is played on an organ at the cemetery. 
And that's it, folks. Cinematographer Richard H. Klein had a track record with sci-fi movies, having lensed The Andromeda Strain, Silent Green, and Battle for the Planet of the Apes. His work on The Terminal Man is wonderfully stark and peppered with memorable noirish touches. A particular scene with Joan Hackett and Richard Dysart on the roof of the hospital is a notable example. It almost looks black and white, with the two characters in black evening wear set against a misty off-white background with static empty spaces all around them. The Terminal Man Man isn't fast-paced or filled with frantic action, and it's certainly not a laugh riot. Me though, I thought it was a knockout. It's a stripped-back science fiction mood piece made with thought and forensic flair, with a frosty eye for detail, and as such will leave some cold and unengaged. It warns of the potential dangers of merging man with machine and the unpredictable effects that may result. You can see the link and inspiration for more extreme cinematic fantasies about human-computer hybrids such as Robocop. As a film, I don't think it's ever been re-evaluated appreciatively enough. So from my perspective, I can only tell you that I think it's great. And unsurprisingly, that's good enough for me. Thank you for your time and attention. If entertained in the remotest, please consider hitting like or don't like, leaving a comment or subscribing. Next, I may be heading into somewhat lighter territory or into something more challenging and controversial, depending on how the mood takes me. Whatever, I will be back. Later, pilgrims.